uh, I remember the women were great. Uh, they they were they were like really what you would think as gangsters, wives and things. I think you could have killed somebody right in front of them. They'd help you move the body. In this video, former Mafia underboss Sammy the Bull Gravano continues to discuss some of the Gambino family captains who operated under John Gotti up until his arrest in late 1990. Let's check it out. Okay, another old timer here. Obviously, Pasquale Patsy Conti, um, old time captain. Yeah. Um, what are your memories of Patsy? Patsy was an old greaseball, old timer, very, very, very wealthy. He owned a chain of uh, grocery stores. Um, I think he owned four of them, and he was on the executive board to all of them. Um, they would, they, they, he had a guy on them, a made guy. Heroin was coming into the country through his guy. And uh, he was giving a ton of money to Paul. Uh, I never forget, I told a story. I went to uh, Paul and uh, Christmas and I got a small little something for him. This fucking guy bought him a fucking Mercedes, a $60,000 Mercedes for Christmas. So I said, you know, I, we, I look like a jerk off with a fucking envelope and this guy's buying a $60,000 Mercedes. Um, do you have any memories of another captain, Frank, Frankie Dap Dapolito? I think he was captain from around 86 until 1997. Do you have any yeah. memories of him at all? Yeah, yeah. I knew Frankie Dap well. Um, he set up a couple of commission meetings for us. Um, we went to a, commi a commission meeting, uh, me and John, with uh, Chin and Benny Eggs, Gas Pipe and Vic Muso. And it was in a building that he had an apartment. Chin also had an apartment in there. And uh, we had a commission meeting in this place. He set it all up. Um, a good guy, a real good guy. Um, he was from that neighborhood in Chin's area. Chin knew him, liked him, trusted him to set the meeting up. Um, so he was used for a lot of things like that. And I, 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 I always got along with him. He was a nice guy. I didn't do any business with him, but um, I knew him well. Um, and what about Joseph Joe Arcuri? Um, I think he was a captain from like the 19, around 1970 until about 2007. Joe Arcuri? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I'm having a brain fart. I know who he is, but I don't know if I did anything with him. Joe Arcuri. Okay. Giuseppe Joe Arcuri was a mobster in a crew run by his father, Domenico, in the 1960s. In around 1970, Joe Arcuri took over as captain of the crew, formerly run by his father. Arcuri was a low-key captain who was an important figure in construction and labour racketeering. In the 1990s, some sources state that Joseph Arcuri was promoted to serve in the Gambino family's hierarchy. Um, and a guy we mentioned in the last video, Mario Red Trainer, who was the son of Giuseppe Joe Trainer, who was a very influential mobster in the 1920s, um, back, in, back in that time. Um, yeah, I think you, you, you've mentioned Red Trainer in, in the last video. Can you tell us a bit more about him? Yeah, he was, a, he was an older guy, nice guy, real mild-mannered guy. He came out of Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, he lived. He he lived maybe only three four blocks away from where I lived in Bensonhurst, and I always knew him as an older guy. He had some dogs, uh, real friendly guy. Um, he had something to do with the unions. I believe uh, Louis Jardina, who was the head of the laborers' union, was with him, and uh, I did business with uh, the laborers' union. But it started through Mario Train. He was very, very friendly with Tato. He was friendly with everybody. Good guy. Um, you know, just neighborhood. He was a neighborhood guy who'd sit out there with people from the neighborhood would come. He would help them with their problems. Like a, like a movie type of uh, wise guy out there. And uh, really a nice guy. No matter what you asked him for, however he could help you, he would help you. So... But I didn't really do too many things with him other than the union. But he gave me his guy to deal with. Once he told Louis Jardina, 
do it, Sabbath, Sammy. Help him whatever you could help him with. And I and I always, you know, I not bypassed him, but I went to Louis Jardina direct with uh, Laborers Union, and uh, he ran that whole union. He put and, and he even even Louis Jardina was a different type of guy. Um, he was a gangster, but he puts his wife, wife, his daughter in the thing. His son was a lawyer. He ran the whole union. I think he was the president of the union. He took it over. So he, he got elected as the union guy. He took over that whole union, lock, stock, and barrel. So Mary Redrain was just a, 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 a guy who was well-liked by everyone in the family, um, just a very affable old-timer, basically. Yes, I, I never heard a bad word about him. You know, I would have defended it because I liked him, but I never heard anybody say anything bad about him. Which brings me to someone who people sometimes do say a bad word about, um, Joseph Joe the Cat Lafort, obviously a very wealthy guy. Um, what, what were your memories of him? Well, I had a lot of transactions with him. Uh, I went on vacation with my wife. He was there with his wife. We, we spent some time on vacation together. Um, he had uh, uh, some of my, my kids, my daughter, uh, was friendly with uh, his daughter and uh, his sons. He had sons in the neighborhood. So our families knew each other. Um, uh, another good guy, he was extremely wealthy because years ago, before they built the Staten Island Bridge, um, he was out there and they used to call, it was farmland. And he was taking numbers and sports and stuff like that. And nobody cared because you couldn't get there. You had to take a fucking boat to get there. So they said it's his. He, he controlled that whole thing. Now, when they built the bridge, the decision stayed that that stuff is his, that area is his. Now that, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people moved there, the gambling and everything became through the roof. So he became super wealthy. Um, him and John didn't get, he, John didn't like him. He wanted money off of him. Yeah, that was my understanding, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, he was abusive towards him. Um, he came to my house one time. My wife was there, and uh, uh, he was beg begging me for help. He said, John's trying to shake me down. He actually owned the building where John had the club. He originally yeah, well, owned, yeah. owned that building. He owned a big, big ranch or, or place up in Adirondack someplace. I, I was going to go there once. I was I, I was thinking of wanting to buy buy it or buy land around it, but I never I never went. I knew his sons well. There's a guy who shot a shot uh, at a uh, legitimate guy shot at uh, uh, John Gotti. That's right. Then uh, he's the sweet shop in Staten Island. Yes, so yes. The guy started to Joe run. Joe Watt shot to death. Yeah. Yeah. Bobby Borriello chased the guy, caught him. They shot him in the ass. They brought him to that sweet shop, that Joe the Cat's sweet mm -hmm. shop. Um, they took him in the basement there. He was a religious fanatic. He was quoting the Bible. He wanted to kill John. He All this weird stuff. But John had Joe Watts go there. I was involved there a little bit with the sons. Uh, and just to find out who gave him orders to do it. Nobody gave him orders. He was talking religious stuff. And then John finally gave the order to kill him. Uh, Joe Watts killed him. When they closed up, they were going to get rid of the body the next day. But something happened. The door didn't lock. The door was open. When a squad car passed by, they saw the door. The place was closed. The door was open a little bit. They went in to investigate, and they found the body in the basement. Um, Joe Cat or his kids, nobody got arrested because he said, you know, I closed the store. I don't know what happened. They broke in. I don't know what happened. And they didn't have no evidence about what happened, and uh, I, I don't think anybody got hurt with that case. No, that's right. Uh, what are your memories of George DeChico? Yeah, it was Frankie's uh, uncle. Um Bougie's brother, and uh, there was a lot of the Chicos. The Chicos, there was a lot of them. Um, 
he became a captain after the, you know, Frankie got promoted to underboss. And yeah. he promoted, he was a made guy, Giorgio Di Chico. He made him a captain in his position. So he was there. Um, he was, uh, he had a lot of things going on in Vegas. A lot of the times he was in Vegas most of the time. Then he'd come back to the Brooklyn. There was a whole bunch of the Chicos and all different kinds of stories. He wasn't a bad guy. He wasn't liked by a lot of people. Why, why so? I don't know. He's, he, he had some sort of like an, an attitude. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I had one problem with him once. And uh, after that, I, I, I never had a problem with him. He used to come down to tall, tallies when I did my books and records and all that bullshit on a Tuesday and I had all my people come down. He would come down with some of his guys and hang out. So he was all right with me. He had this, his other brother, Butterass. He never got made. But um, I knew him. I knew his daughters. I knew the whole family. You know, F Frankie Fab, he was a cousin. He's He was with the Chicos, Frankie Fabiano. Um, Robert Fabiano, his fa Frankie Fab's father, he was one of the, the Chicos too. So, uh, I mean, there was an army of them. Uh, I remember the women were great. Uh, they they were they were like really what you would think as gangsters, wives and things. I think you could have killed somebody right in front of them. They'd help you move the body. Maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but they were they were good women. They 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 knew the mob. They knew the streets, and uh, they were just very friendly. One of them worked in a diner. I mean, they, they were good people. Okay, so let's discuss a bit more about so old time old time captain Olympia Garuffalo, who was succeeded by Paulie Zack, who you said was a good guy. Do you remember Olympia at all? Olympia Lilo Garuffalo? Yes, I, I remember Lilo. I, I had no transactions with him. It was a real old old guy. He must it was a lot older than me, way older. And uh, he stepped down and he was replaced by a Paulie Zack, who was really a good guy. And very knowledgeable of the mob. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, he was like a historian with the mafia. You know, he, he can talk about things and he just really smart guy. A gambler. He used to stay by uh, 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 this guy, Anthony Spiro, was a concierge of Banana family. He would hang out by that guy's club. They were close, close friends. Um, everybody liked him in the neighborhood. And was was he succeeded by Jackie Nose? Am I right there? No, I don't think so. No. He he might have been, I don't know. Jackie Nose, um, I don't think he was a powerhouse. I mean, he, he, he really was a, he became a made guy. He might have been, he might have been succeeded by that. I, I don't know. But um, Jackie Nose, what, what could I say? I mean, he was like a lobby boy for John. Go get the car, go do this, go do that. He, you know, I don't want to call him a flunky, but um, they actually even made him an under uh, boss, acting boss, while John was in jail. I just think they needed somebody that they could control. And, you know, he wasn't a bad guy. Matter of fact, I had a diamond ring, pinky ring. He, he was in jewelry. And he took out a ring when I was in the club one day. And I liked it. It was a, it was about a two carry, whatever it was. And it was a nice pinky ring. So I said, how much is this? I'll buy it. He says, you like it? Yeah. And he, he gave it to me. He didn't even charge me. So he, he was a good guy. Um, a little weird, but, uh, you know, I okay. don't know if he did anything, really. And um, how about Frankie Lucasio? Frankie Lucasio was a captain. He replaced somebody. He was a captain in the Bronx. Real tough guy. Good guy. I was very close with him. I went to prison. We went to prison together. We were there. There's so many stories with being him yeah. in prison. And even after prison, you know, I have um, files when I got out after I cooperated. His lawyers got in touch with me. And I put in motions that the charge he got convicted of, he, a murder, 
of uh, Louis de Bono. I wrote a statement that he did, he had nothing to do with the murder. I had something to do with it. He had nothing to do with it. The only thing he had to do with it is he knew that it was going to be done. But he had no part in it. And uh, the judge didn't want to hear it. And I signed documents and all kinds of stuff. I still have that stuff. Um, the, they, they appealed it again to the Second Circuit. The Second Circuit sent down a decision to the judge, have a hearing, bring Ravano in and have a hearing because he wouldn't bring me in and even talk to me, the judge. And he still refused. And uh, after John died, um, there's a whole story that the lawyer, his lawyer, when I was testifying, should have asked me questions. Was Frankie involved in this murder? I had told the government, sometimes you're going to like me, sometimes you're going to hate me, because why? Because in my opinion, Frankie had nothing to do with the murder. And they said, Sammy, just tell the truth. If that's what you think, just say it. So I was going to say it, but John threatened Frankie's lawyer that if he asked me that question or any questions that um, he would kill him. And he backed up, the lawyer backed up. He just talked to this Mikey Scars on a show. And uh, he lied about what he did. I have the documents, I have the papers, because he, he even said it, that he was threatened. Now, if you're a lawyer, he shouldn't even be a lawyer, this guy. you got to represent your guy. Now, if you're scared, and just back away as a lawyer. Don't not do it. You did more damage to Frank. You lost the case for Frankie. Now, John's thinking was, Sammy's going to tell the truth that he's got nothing to do with it. So Sam is going to look like being very truthful because he hurt the government by saying Frankie had nothing to do with the murder. And he thought that would make me look credible. So he threatened the lawyer not to ask me that question. And what he did is sacrifice Frankie when you actually look at it. And the lawyer sacrifice his client, which is unethical. And uh, he shouldn't even be a lawyer. He shouldn't have a license. He should be thrown out. Because this is what you did. You put Frankie away by not asking that simple question. Because they knew what I would answer. Frankie said, Samuel, tell the truth. I did a part in that. I was part of it. I brought, we, we were trying to get him for eight months, not we. John was trying to get him. He gave the contract to his son who couldn't get it done. And he would give John a bullshit story that he was out of the country. So let me tell the story to how would it. Uh, so at one point, Joey Madonia and I was partners in a drywall company, came to me. I wasn't partners no more, it was his but we were still friends. And he said, Sammy, Louis de Bono's got a billion dollars worth of work. Could you get me some work? So I said, yeah, he's out of the country right now, but uh, yeah, when he comes back. He said, no, he didn't leave the country. Now he didn't know nothing. This is a legitimate guy. And uh, I said, uh, where is he? How do you know he's not uh, out of the country? He says he's in the World Trade Center. He's got an office in there. He gave me his card. So I says, all right, as soon as I see him, I'll ask you for some work. I didn't tell him nothing was going on. I went down New York with Big Louie Valerio, and I was going to meet with Johnny Gamarano. And he helped me with union things, he worked with me. Johnny Gamarano said, Sammy, you know I got the part, they were, they were doing construction he says, you know, I got the parking lot, this whole dirt lot across the street. 
cost a fortune to park your car in every day in the World Trade Center. So I said, well, good, good for you. He, and he said, well, Louis de Bono is a friend of ours. He didn't know what was going on. He said, he's parking in the World Trade Center every day. It's costing him a fortune. I'll charge him almost nothing to, to park in the parking lot. He's in the World Trade Center parking every day? Yes. You know where it parks were building and all? Yeah. He told me the building and the floor and everything. And that on his plate of the car, a Cadillac, I think it was, had the Bono plates. And I left. And I went back to the club. And Frankie Lacasio came in. And I told him what I'm telling you. I said, I know where he is. He's not out of the country. He's in the World Trade Center. And he parks in the fucking building every day. He said, what are you going to do? Frankie asked me. I said, I'm going to tell John as soon as he gets here. And I did. That's why I know Frankie had nothing to do with it. He knew that it was going to happen, but he had nothing to do with it whatsoever. And uh, I told John, I said, listen, here's this card. Here's his office. Here's where he parks, what floor, what building, everything. You want me to take care of this? I hated him for what he had done with me earlier. You want me to take care of this? He said, no, 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 no. My, my son will take care of it. I said, all right. A week and a half, two weeks after I gave that information, he was killed in the World Trade Center in the parking lot. There's guys who did it with him. And I'm not even interested. I don't care who did what. But... That's how I honestly said Frankie Lacasio had no, he had knowledge of it. Now, if you have knowledge of a, a crime and you don't report it, that's a five-year sentence. He wasn't part of the murder. That's a life sentence. I was part of the murder by, by getting the card, by knowing where he was parked, and I'm part of it. And that's why I had told the government. When I go out, that's what I'm going to tell them on the stand. So, and, and I think he would have got convicted of a five-year sentence. But instead, I wasn't asked that question or the story. I couldn't tell it. And he got life without parole and died in prison. Okay. Well, you mentioned Junior Gotti there. I mean, sources indicate that John made his son a captain in what, about the summer of 1990, a few months before your arrest. Is, is that your memory as well? Yes. Yeah. The, 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 yes. uh, a little bit more than, in other words, I, I, I made him. I, I did the ceremony. A boss shouldn't be there to make your own son. Yeah, but and he was I, made captain. He was made a captain in the summer of 90. I did that as well with, oh, okay. with Frankie Lacasio. Me and Frankie Lacasio went down and saw him and told him, Do, would you know how to handle being a captain? The representative, your boss wants to know. Not your father, your boss. And he said yes, and we made him right on the spot. We took him back. We introduced him to his father as a new captain. We introduced some guys, Bobby Barriello and people he put with him. And, uh, and that's how he was made. I made him, and then I made him a captain. Okay. Um, were you familiar with the, the Baltimore crew for the Gambinos? I think they were run by a guy called Frank Corby. Did you have much to do, to do with the Baltimore guys? No. Okay. Um, and I've got another name here. I've got Ralph, Ralphie Bones Mosca, who was um, from the 1980s until 1999. Nothing at all with them? Yeah, I, I knew Ralphie Bones very well. Um, again, he's one of the captains. I met him at parties, Christmas, at all these things and events. But uh, I don't think I did anything with him. Anthony Sonny Saccone, or Saccone. Yeah, you, he was the head of the... He, have, he had an involvement with Stephen C. Gall at one point, I believe. Yeah, he was the head of the Longshoremen's Unions. He took it over. Um, when Tough Tony went to prison, they took him down, and they made him a captain and take over the, the thing. Um, 
later on in life is, uh, you know, he's an important guy in a way because he runs the piers. So you're supposed to leave him alone, let him run the piers, bring in the money. He wasn't a bad guy, he was a pretty good guy. Peter Gotti became the boss when John was in jail, acting boss. And uh, the, the actor stopped doing movies. So they weren't getting kickbacks, Steven Seagal. And uh, he got Sonny Saccone, and both of them went to meet with uh, Steven Seagal and told him, they threatened him, to start doing movies again and start giving the kickbacks again. The FBI picked it up. They heard the hearing. They heard the meeting. Um, they went to Steven Seagal. He was scared shit. He didn't want to testify. He didn't want to do anything. They told him he had to. He was going to be subpoenaed. They arrested uh, Peter Gotti and Sonny Saccone. So the ignorance of using Sonny Saccone instead of a tough guy, using a guy who's a big earner for the family and controlling such an important thing, he got him, he got him busted with his stupidity, Peter Gotti. But anyway, getting to the trial, this Steven Seagal had, came out with a blanket. You know when a kid has a, a blanket they, you know, to keep them comfort? Mm -hmm. He had that. Put it on his lap. Was almost in tears when he was testifying. Um, so that's the thing that happened with Steven Seagal with, yeah. that, with the case. Uh, the newspapers, I think, ripped him apart saying that he was in tears and uh, he had a, what do you call that, a comforter blanket or something? Yeah, like a comforter, yeah. Yeah, like a security blanket or some fucking thing on his yeah. legs and whatever. And uh, I don't remember what happened with the case. I think they, they, won they actually won the case. Um, and I think Sonny Saccone had to step down as the president of the union or something like that. I hope you found that interesting. Thanks for watching.